Good day, Stephanie. First of all, thank, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Um, it's an, a kind of an interesting background that we have and that we've never met face to face, but I think I've, it feels right. like I've known you for a long time, but we've been connected on LinkedIn and Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how it is in the days of social media, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I, and I probably know you through my connections to Jim Ellsworth and Roger Kaufman, but right. l l let's start with, uh, for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live and work and what you do and perhaps some of the more interesting things that you've worked on in your career? Sure, sure. So hello, everyone. I'm Stephanie Moore. I'm at the University of Virginia here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, a city which has since taken on quite a bit of meaning, <laughs> culturally and socially. Uh, I am a professor in our Instructional Technology and Design program. I'm actually the program coordinator for that. Uh, but prior to this role, I've also been uh, director of assessment for the Department of Education, uh, director of instructional design for our School of Engineering, uh, and a director of online for Curry. Uh, it's nice to be in a typical faculty role now, but actually a lot of my work has been more administrative and leadership positions. So in terms of some of my own past work, I've done a lot of work in particular in building out online programs and online infrastructure is probably a better way to put it. Um, before I went to the Department of Ed, I actually worked as a lead instructional designer for the, uh, what was then called the National Center on Low Incidence Disabilities. Learned a tremendous amount there about how we design um, both conceptually as well as technically for learners with um, a range of disabilities. And it really fundamentally changed me as a designer and as a thinker. And what we, what we did there was we, we started by building online programs. Um, but we uh, received funding to actually build, create this national center where we created like a clearinghouse of research. We also created a lot of performance support tools and job aids and things like that for parents and teachers. So one of my favorite projects I ever created, I mean, and it's still to this day a really popular thing. And gosh, I think we created this like 18 years ago. Um, but one of the parent uh, advocacy groups came to met with us. Their names are uh, their hands and voices. Uh, they're still up and around. And they wanted to create a online class on the law uh, for parents so that when they went into meetings with teachers, uh, you know, they understood the law and they could talk effectively and advocate for their children. And the more I listened to them, the more I thought, boy, I think it's a really unreasonable objective to suddenly try and train up every parent in the country on the law and turn them into a lawyer. Um, and so we, we started talking more about how do we give them supports that they can use real time. So we took all this information that they had and resorted it into this grid. We called it the pop-up IEP. You can actually still Google it and find it today. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we sorted it based on common questions that parents have when they call this organization. Like I was just in an IEP meeting and the, and the principal said X or a teacher said Y. What do I do? Mm -hmm. And so we structured uh, uh, just a single page thing for them where it said, here's a problem with what you heard. Um, here are possible responses, and here are the parts in the law that you're anchored in when you respond. And so they really were just these one-sheet things, and it was set up in a grid online. And it took off like wildfire when we put this together. We found people who were printing it out into binders and taking it into meetings and stuff. And so I think it's just a really good example of how we can start to think not just as instructional designers, but as performance improvement folks to really support people in terms of how they work and how they think about the problems that they're trying to tackle. Um, so I know I've elaborated on that one, but like I said, a lot of my other work was teaching or, or putting together online programs where we look not just at the instructional component, but really what are some of the organizational and, and longer term impacts of what we do. Mm -hmm. So like the work with engineering was actually trying to get engineering education out to rural communities across Virginia. So there we actually used Roger Kaufman's framework as an evaluation framework because we weren't just interested in good online courses that were effective, but we were also interested in what's the impact on the community and how do we make sure that we're having the sort of desired impact that we want to have longitudinally. Excellent. Well, 
thank you. Thank you for your advocacy um, um, work. That's that's an excellent story. <laughs> can, can you please tell us a little bit about your first exposure to human performance technology or performance improvement or whatever phrase you use to describe that set of things? <laughs> I, in some ways, I think this prompts two, two completely different thoughts in my mind. The first is, um, you know, as a graduate student, when I was first learning it mm -hmm. uh, and really first exposed to the ideas, and, and in part, that's what shaped um, the example I just talked about with the pop-up IEP, that as I was learning this thing, you know, here I am in this real context working with an actual client trying to come up with a solution and just kind of starting to think about how do we translate that thinking into, uh, you know, a, a solution for, for a client and the people that we're trying to serve. So in many ways, that really captured for me my first exposure to it mm -hmm. uh, in that regard. But I would say I don't, I really don't feel I fully understood performance improvement and what it really meant and what its potential really was until I met Roger Kaufman and started interacting with him and talking with him about some of that. And I, I um, wanted to do my uh, focus and dissertation for my doctorate on ethics of technology in human systems. And so as I was uh, researching that, I was actually originally working with Jim Ellsworth, who I'd met through AECT. And the more I started talking about ethics, he, he sent me Roger's book and said, you know, I think this is what you mean when you say ethics. And I sat down and read Roger's book and I was like, yeah, this is it. I don't, I don't mean philosophy. I don't mean let's you know, wax obtuse about any of this. It's really how do you drill this down to what's the impact that we, were ha we are having and what do we really desire our impact to be? And th that's Roger Kaufman like in a nutshell. So when I read Roger's work, um, Jim actually connected me with him and <laughs> poor Jim. Uh, Jim came off my dissertation committee. <laughs> And Roger came onto my dissertation committee. And I think it was really from that point forward talking with Roger about a lot of these principles and especially the way that he frames it. Um, for me, that's a very anchoring aspect of my own conception of what HPT is and, and how we leverage that in service of the things that we want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Can you name that? I know Roger has 30-some, 40-some books. Can you name which right. which particular book uh, that was? Right. So he's he's got two that I always think are actually really um, kind of the, the seminal pieces. The first is Mega Planning. Uh, and that's the piece that I had read where he, he really goes into a lot more detail of Mega Planning about what Mega is uh, and defines that in a lot more detail in that book. Um, the other book that he's got is Strategic Planning for Success, and, and I uh, forget the, the long form of the title of that book. Um, but it's, it's in that book where he really outlines what he calls his OEM model uh, that focuses more on, you know, outcomes, outputs, uh, products, you know, and mm -hmm. it, it, he frames his model more there. It's just that in the mega planning book, he goes into a lot more detail around what mega is and, and how you incorporate that into your planning. So for me, with him, there's sort of those, those two seminal pieces. Ah, thank you. Thank you. So besides uh, Roger Kaufman and those two books and, and perhaps Jim Ellsworth, uh, who else are your biggest influences? Are there uh, a peep for our audience? You know, what people, articles or books would you point them to? for them to learn more about human performance technology? Oh, um, so in terms of pointing folks to books, a, a couple different things come to mind. First of all, um, so I teach a class on performance improvement here at UVA. Um, it's become a very popular class, even for our K-12 teachers, which, you know, trying to translate this for teachers has mm -hmm. been a really interesting experience. Um, and we also have folks from our Darden School of Business take it. Um, in that class, even though I'm, uh, I work mostly with Roger, I actually don't use mega planning for the class. We use some excerpts from it, but what I use for the class is Ryan Watkins books, uh, book performance by design. Um, and I think it's just that, you know, Ryan has done a great job pulling together models that people may have, um, other models people may have heard of as well, like doing a SWOT analysis or things like that. Uh, so it's a very approachable book for how to get in, especially for novices, you know, how to get in and do this. 
and the students seem to react extremely well um, to that particular text. We integrate a lot of originals as well. I also use the Mager text. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, uh, oh gosh, guy, you may, I'm, I'm recalling this off the cuff now, but uh, yeah. what is it? What to do, when, how? <laughs> oh, well, I, I always, my favorite was analyzing performance problems or are they really ought to want to, but but that yes that's it no, 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 that no, was the one i was started off when i uh, <laughs> uh, left college and joined the field um and, yes uh, in fact it's a classic funny story about that book in that i i read that book the first week i was in my new job and <laughs> i was so excited about that book i bought four additional copies of it and sent it to my best friends in college, <laughs> who all wrote back because this was 1979 who all wrote back and said what the hell why would i want this book <laughs> And it yes. was just, it was just, anyway. So, uh, so yeah. Ryan's book, Performance by Design. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and the Maker book. No, you're right. That's the title of it. We uh -huh. also use the Maker book because I really like anchoring folks in some of the classics as well. And then we have them reading some uh, pieces by Chevalier mm -hmm. uh, and Rumler in there. Um, there's a really good review of the different models of the field by Stepich and Viachica. Um, and then we go, and then we really go deep into Ryan Watkins' book. We also integrate in some Dessinger and Mosley mm -hmm. on um, confirmative evaluation. So I think all of those things together, if you, especially if we were going to say this is what would get folks a really good foundation for how you get started and get going with this line of practice, uh, those are all key pieces. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you do, you know, how, how do you go about explaining what you do to others? <laughs> yeah, 30 second pitch on that is hard. Um, but the, let me put it this way, we're, we're doing a project right now where we're working with teachers uh, and schools. Uh, so small schools and medium sized schools because they tend to be not as resource rich mm -hmm. and talking about performance improvement. And what I, what I tell them is, you know, we want to drill down below um, just the problems that you think are going on to really identify what are the root causes and what are the things that we can come up to help address those root causes so that the things that aren't working well start to work better and you start to see the sorts of results that we really want to see and I, I think that's sort of it in a nutshell that's that always helps communicate quickly mm -hmm. <laughs> to folks who are outside of our field and they're like, yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So I, I usually use examples like, um, you know, training or professional development is, it, it may be a great solution uh, or part of it, but it's certainly not going to help us get to all of it. And, you know, you readily understand, uh, you know, you teacher, you principal readily understand that, um, you know, just doing a professional development session isn't enough uh, because maybe folks don't have resources. Maybe they don't have um uh, it's not part of the job description. Maybe, you know, for whatever reason, there's some disincentives or some policies in the way. And so we really try and look at what are those barriers mm -hmm. so that we can remove those barriers to performance, not just assume a one-shot workshop is going to yeah. make a difference. So Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I ordered the other day, it just came yesterday, your 2010 book, Ethics by Design, <laughs> so I'd like to have you tell us a little bit about that, and then what is your current focus for your own professional, personal learning? Uh, what are you writing? What So what are you working on to, you know, as a lifelong learner, where, where are you going? But first of all, start with this Ethics by Design book. Well, the, the two are really hand in hand because I think that's um, where I'm starting to try and deepen my own knowledge as well. So. When I actually got into the field of instructional design and technology, my real passion was ethics of technology. Um, and the story of that comes actually from a class I took on classical Greek rhetoric, of all things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, when I made the shift, I just thought, you know, we just we, we don't have enough people thinking critically about technology. How do we design it? How do we shape it? How do we integrate it and implement it? And all those good things that, frankly, our field is actually well suited to we just don't tend to think about or talk about ourselves uh in that manner and so uh when i switched uh, degree programs entirely uh, uh you know focusing on ethics was one thing i really wanted to do i was told repeatedly though 
that, you know, nobody's done that before. It's not a valuable thing to focus on. Don't do that. Um, you know, head this way or that way instead. And I, I really have to give props to, um, we had a couple of retirements or whatnot from a program. And I got a new advisor who said, you know, this isn't my area. I'm not comfortable with it, but it's important. So I'm going to support you in that. That was uh, Linda Lore, who's amazing. And then um, I happened to meet Jim at, where did I meet him? Either AECT or ISPI and Jim Ellsworth. And we got to talking about this too. And he said, yeah, this is really important. And then, like I said, he connected me with Roger and we pulled all these, I you know, pulled all these pieces together around what do I really mean by ethics? Uh, like I said, most of the way most folks talk about it is, you know, different philosophical dispositions and doing your own self-analysis of what are your own personal values or things like that. And that's that's just not how I wanted to go about this. So the book is really an extension of my dissertation, not so much the study piece of it, but the literature review, just going out and gathering all this information about what folks like um, Roger Kaufman or uh, I think Peter Dean was reading or writing on some of this as well. And Ingrid had done her dissertation on the standards for ISPI and a piece of that had looked at integration of ethics into the standards. Uh, and so, you know, pulled all of these pieces together into what I tried to articulate in that book was how do we leverage design processes and planning processes so that we really get intentional about the outcomes and the impacts of what it is that we're doing. Um, instead of, there's a great quote that I got from William McDonough, who, um, his book is called Cradle to Cradle Design, and he's a, an environmental engineer who's been around a long time. And he gave, gave a great talk where he talked about um, we are, how we are strategically tragic uh, because we don't think about these longer term impacts, even though we really have the capability to do so. And I think if you think about it, that's exactly what Roger's mega model is about. Very longitudinal, really thinking about what are those external impacts. And instead of sort of lamenting unintended consequences how do we then feed that back into the front end and treat that as a front end input in terms of these are the desired impacts that we want to have. Uh, and it's not just a learning impact or an organizational impact like profit, which are fine, um, but there are these other sorts of impacts that we want to have as well. Uh, and that may be self-sufficiency, impact on the environment, you know, a number, you know, making sure people don't die as a result of what an organization produces or become sick because of that. You know, very real world stuff that we tend to say, oh, ethics, that's obtuse, or, you know, people don't care about it. But in the end, to, from my perspective, most of the problems in the world that people did care about actually came right down to ethical considerations and how do we build that in. So that's what the book is about, is trying to articulate how do we integrate that into a planning process. And by design just means... How do we make that very intentional act? Mm -hmm. um, and so in terms of where I'm extending my own work now, it's actually, I'm, I'm sort of coming full circle. It's like I got down into the weeds of performance improvement. <laughs> I really focused a lot more on, you know, the good old, you know, assessment and needs analysis and all that good stuff. And now I'm kind of coming back full circle to surface back up and say, okay, I want to return to this focus on ethics and look at things like, data use and privacy, um, accessibility, copyright, you know, all these things that we consider these longer term impacts and uh, focus more on, first of all, my own understanding about how do we, how do we teach that stuff? How do we define that? How do you actually integrate that into a meaningful performance plan? Uh, and then um, work with my students to generate um, case studies or better, better examples or things that we can get out into the research or literature to just help articulate all this more. It's it's a very underdeveloped area, and so my focus is trying to develop that more. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a good segue, to perhaps, to my next question, which is, is there a favorite HPT term or phrase that you'd like to define for us, uh, perhaps because you feel the current understanding or use of that term or phrase is problematic? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that question was a little is a little tough for me because um, what I tend to run into is more of a concern that I, I, I feel like I keep seeing a lot of recreating the wheel. Mm 
Mm -hmm. that there are a lot of folks out there trying to develop new things or try and put new terms or new labels on things that, frankly, we've actually already done a pretty good job identifying or defining. Um, And so a lot of what I see out there that's new, I'm like, well, gosh, that's, you know, if you go back to Rumler, if you go back to Chevalier, you know, if you go back to some of these pieces, Mm -hmm. we've already mapped out uh, a lot of really reliable constructs that we can use. Um, I think one of the things I, you know, in working with students and helping novices learn things, a concept more than a term that we have a lot, well, two concepts that we have a lot of uh, conversations about. Uh, One is defining needs, which, uh, of course, Roger Kaufman spends a lot of time discussing that as well. Well, How do you actually define a need and what is that? And getting folks to pivot off of need as being, oh, I need to use the latest and greatest technology. We're using need as a verb. Rather, how do we define need as a gap? Um, <clears throat> as a sort of a corollary to that, what I encounter often is this idea of uh, needs and objectives being measurable and accessible. Um, I get sort of increasing you know, reaction to this concept of, Oh, I can't make something measurable. Uh, you know, I can't. I can't make this abstract thing measurable. And so there's a there's this reactionary stance uh, from students often of, um, therefore, your model must be wrong, mm-hmm. <laughs> rather than my thinking about um, how do we measure, how do we assess things. And so <clears throat> I actually always share an example with them uh, from. Uh, one of my early interactions with Roger that was just, I think for me, this just sort of forever changed my own thinking about it. And I come back to it repeatedly as an example to remind myself as well. We were we were hosting a conference on ethics at uh, UNC, uh, University of Northern Colorado, where I was at. And um, I'd invited him out to be uh, part of a guest panel on that. And of course, Roger's doing his typical kind of Roger thing, uh, and he Roger can be very exacting. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody in the audience raised her hand and said, um, but how do you define love? And why would we want to try and define something like love? Like, love is way too beautiful to try and fit in this box mm-hmm. of always having to measure and assess everything. And I really will never forget Roger's answer. He said, well... But isn't it important to, at a minimum, understand, even just psychologically and emotionally, what, what is love and what is non-love? Because we all experience love in our lives and we all experience non-love. And isn't the ability to distinguish between those two things important? And as soon as you start to talk about, well, what is love and what is not love, and you can draw a portrait in your mind of what those two things are, I mean, the this is a really important thing that suddenly becomes important to your own psychological, emotional survival and health and well-being. And, you know, of course, the conversation just immediately pivoted at that point. And and I just, I thought, you know, it, that captured in my mind just how important it is that we be able to step back on things things that we think are abstract there are really fundamental ways of distinguishing, okay, I, I can tell you both what this is, what this looks like in action, what it yields, what its results and impacts are, and also when we're dealing with the opposite of that or the things that we don't want to see. You know, we see the fruit of that as well. We see the impact of that as well. So, you know, I have students in my class who say, you know, how do I, how would I measure anything like resilience? That's one that comes up a lot. You know, we want our students to, res- to be resilient. We want to help them facilitate, you know, develop resilience. What does that mean? That's a really abstract term. Mm-hmm. And so I start them just with very basic ideas like, but what does a resilient learner look like or resilient person look like? And what does a non-resilient learner mm-hmm. or person look like? And now let's sort of treat that as sort of like a five and a one on a rubric. And how do you kind of go from there to what does a student look like if they're resilient in some aspects but not other aspects and let's you know let's start taking all of this apart and suddenly the thing that's very abstract becomes measurable and accessible 
you know, we can start to define it and then we can start to track it and say, okay, you know, yes, we're making progress or no, we're not making progress along this important uh, metric that we've just defined. Thank you. That's excellent. That's a long elaboration um, for a quick definition. But. Well, but you, but we talked about m measurement and how you can approach some abstract kinds of constructs to begin to approach measuring them by defining them and the stages mm -hmm. in between. So thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to accomplish with this video series is to capture stories of people involved in human performance technology, whether they were associated with NSPI, now ISPI, or not. Um, so in advance, I had suggested to you that I was going to be looking for these stories. So I'm expecting to hear a story or two about Roger Coleman. <laughs> Perhaps you've exhausted them, but I doubt it. Or Jim Ellsworth <laughs> or, or others from, from your exposure to this. What have you got? <laughs> Oh, gosh. Um, so, a, a lot come to mind. Um, one of the things that we did a while back um, through AECT was um, I, I actually initiated a, we called it a History Makers, and that ended up being a trademark name. And now um, Barbara Lockie down at Virginia Tech hosts all of that, and they had to change the name. And I'm, I apologize, I don't recall the new name. But the very first interview that we started with was actually talking with Roger Kaufman. Mm -hmm. uh, and for part of that, I remember having these conversations with him early on, not just about the details of his model, but how did he arrive at this? Because I thought I always thought that was a fascinating story in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Roger's background is actually in psychology. And so his model stems from um, uh, what's called action psychology. And I think you begin to see that, the more you understand that connection, the more you see that really come out in his model in spades, that for him, this is all about like will and agency and intent, um, that we, we as human beings have agency, we have will and intent. And um, if we choose to exercise that, you know, we can, we can define these things to improve them. We can adopt them and say, you know, uh, I want X to be better, so now I'm, I'm going to treat that as an objective and, and drive things in that direction. Uh, and so when we interviewed him, you know, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the psychological underpinnings of his model uh, and how that plays out. And conversely, too, he shared with us how um, his son was one of the biggest influences because uh, he likes to tell the story about how he would talk with his son about, you know, his son would say, well, why this and why that? And Roger kind of hit a point where he didn't have an answer and he, you know, he would just say, because I told you so. And he didn't find that to be a terribly satisfying answer. And trying to answer that question, like why is X important? Why is Y important? Is actually part of what started him on this path of thinking about mega. You know, what's important because we don't want to cause people harm. We don't want to cause injury. You know, we don't, uh, you know, we don't want to cause damage to X or Y. And those are ultimately the things that are really important. And, you know, in talking through that with him and, and researching more on ethics myself and then pulling that back together in conversations with him, we had a lot of conversations over time about how this is really um, what he started to capture in Mega is sort of this business case for commonly held ethics or values or principles that, you know, if you look across major world religions, major works on ethics, things like that, you know, you see these same strands uh, coming up uh, time and time again. And so I think for me, just, you know, recalling that for Roger, this isn't anchored in some academic exercise. And for most of us, this isn't anchored in an academic exercise. I think at, because I have a PhD after my name, I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just always think, no, gosh, for me, for, for everybody involved, I mean, this really comes down to trying to drill down to like what's real in life and what we've really encountered in life um, and in life situations and in real organizations, you know, the things that we really want to drill down and get to. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, so, you know, other stories, uh, I would say, uh, Roger, I'm sorry, 
Ryan Watkins and Ingrid Guerra have been um, two other very influential folks who I think if, if folks have the opportunity to find them out, uh, you know, any of these folks out at ISPI and spend some time and talk with them or read their work, um, they're really, truly fantastic uh, individuals to talk with. Um, so I've worked with Ingrid on one project at the World Bank um, at, where we were actually looking at using Rogers Mega in component uh, or in partnership with understanding like what uh, what are high conflict situations in countries, what role does education play in either mitigating conflict or furthering conflict uh, or crisis in a region. So I always thought that's a really good example of how mega is so important. You know, we're not just looking at our students learning something, but what role is an educational system playing in crisis or conflict in a region? Um, and we can ask that in, in any context, really. Uh, and so she and I worked together on this project with the World Bank um, where we were examining different examples of that. But she's gone on to do more work on that in Colombia and can speak much more extensive to that, extensively to that uh, because her family's from Colombia and she knows the context incredibly well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will never forget going into this meeting. You know, here we are in this meeting with the World Bank uh, and, and Ryan does similar work with USAID as well. I mean, these are entities that have significant global impact. And it's at this point that it really begins to sink in that, you know, the work we do isn't just academic. It's not just these models and these articles and stuff, but rather we're about to do some stuff that is going to significantly impact a lot of people's lives. And, you know, watching Ingrid in action is just like watching a master at work. Um, she has such a fantastic way of articulating things for folks in a way that's very approachable, very accessible. She has some of the best style out there. And so her, her facilitative approach, you know, a lot of times we think it's about these concepts and stuff, but more often than not, it's really about how do we engage with people about this so that we're, we're inviting them into a space where they feel like they're participating, mm -hmm. that they're constructing this with us. You know, we're not there telling them or lecturing or, you know, whatever, but rather how do, how do we make them partners and owners of this process? And we just sort of enable them as they go through that. Um, I think Ingrid is, is just that in spades uh, in our field. Ryan, uh, I, I mean, similarly, has just the most approachable demeanor. I think he's one of the most cited people in our field now. But he's also one of the most approachable people uh, to talk to. And I think he also does a lot of excellent work in trying to articulate things and provide examples and things like that in a manner that's very approachable, very translatable. Um, and I know right now he's doing extensive work getting into um, needs and defining needs and what are different tools for needs analysis. He's got a great website and for his sabbatical, he um, created this whole group around needs where he's actually having folks from, oh gosh, economics and health field and you know all different groups um, that are in sort of this informal network sharing about and talking about this idea of needs. You know, how do we define needs? Um, what are different ways of going about uh, analyzing needs as a result? And I think he's greatly expanding our discourse uh, in the field, as well as helping to bring in the discourse that's going on in other fields that's very similar to this. So, um, you know, those those are certainly two key individuals that for me come to mind as folks who have shaped my own thoughts, as well as people who I think are really significantly shaping the field to come. Well, thank you for that. The, 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 these are excellent people and resources for <laughs> anybody entering the field or have been around and haven't uh, uh, investigated any of their work. Um, Thank you. Uh, as we wrap up here, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for um, our audience related to performance improvement, human performance technology? What what guidance can you give them? Um, so that that's a very good question. I think in my mind, um, the big thing right now that I would emphasize is to try and learn and really anchor yourself anchor yourself in evidence-based practices. Um, in fact, one of the ways that Guy and I met uh, was through a lot of online discussions precisely about that, about what does a 
research actually have to show us? And how can that research inform our practices? And that doesn't mean you have to sit down and read a ton of research articles or anything like that. I mean, we've got a lot of folks like Will Tallheimer, um, who's all, that's another good name to mention, mm -hmm. um, Guy, uh, Dick Clark, you know, folks who are really trying to pull this together and summarize this and say, okay, here are the implications of research for practice. Um, I, I think we should be doing more of that as a field. And for anybody, uh, you know, listening or watching this, I think that's going to be a uh, important thing to focus on. Because to my mind, and this is really part of the, the idea behind ethics too, that's what distinguishes us from snake oil salesmen uh, who are trying to just sell X or Y. It sound, you know, it's a bunch of rhetoric, but it's not really going to have an impact. And it sounds flashy. And we see it all the time, and not, not just in performance improvement, but also instructional design and technology. There's always some new tool, some new thing. Most of it either isn't vetted or doesn't, you know, pass a giggle test when it comes to research. Um, so I think if, you know, if you're really seeking to be a professional in the field who uh, aims to, uh, you know, meet the standards uh, of ISPI, anchoring yourself in those practices is important. You know, things like understanding that learning styles don't exist. Uh, there is no research to support that. So trying to design anything according to that uh, simply doesn't work. Uh, there's a lot of emerging myths around neuroscience because people are fascinated by the brain. Uh, you know, they, they love these stories, but when we really put it to the test, things just either don't bear out or what folks are trying to sell you it is really a, a um, contortion of what the research has had to say on that. So, you know, find folks who talk about research-based practices and follow them and, you know, just start building up that repertoire. I couldn't agree with you more. Stephanie, thank you so much for participating in this interview with me. Thank uh, you for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you, and have a good day. You too. Thanks right. so much, Guy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.